the few discussion points. I'll just suggest a few, and, but you know, there, there are others, obviously. How valid are such constructs as the law of supply and demand? Um, do they actually, is that how you'd expect a market to behave? Is equilibrium um, anything more than a platonic ideal? And if so, what value does it have? What about positive and normative economics? Is equilibrium meant to be a, you know, a positive concept or is it a normative one? Is it something that exists naturally um, unless it's interfered with or is it something that should be striven for um, and created by, by policy of one kind or another? Um, I was going to say that it, in, in some ways it seems like actually economics is almost like the opposite of science because science starts with observations and it sees in real world events correlations and things happening at the same time or happening regularly and then on that basis it infers laws and it says there's a law of gravity for example because you're, we always see things dropping to the ground but it seems like economics goes the other way around and it starts with the laws and the assumptions about how things are and how people behave and the basic facts uh, of, of what determines what happens. And then on that basis, it, it says, so we can expect to find, for example, an equilibrium in the market. But it actually starts with the facts rather than starting with the observations. So it kind of takes it from the opposite point of view that science does. But I'm not, I'm not sure that is... Now, a lot of people would, 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 would agree with you that that's the way science works. I mean, that's sort of kind of induct, inductive view of science. I think if it, if it were considered a scientific law or a scientific conclusion that's shared by the scientific community, I think they would only accept that as a law uh, if, it was, if it had been inductively proved over many years. Yeah, it has to be inductively proved, but it, it's not inductively, it's not inductively, um, it, it, it's imagined. Yeah, just to say one more thing about that is that, I mean, that doesn't seem an unreasonable approach that you imagine what the law might be and then you trial it and you test it out. And then if the trials confirm it over many trials, then you say, OK, maybe that is a law. But it seems that economics comes up with the imagination part, but it doesn't trial it. I mean, when someone came up with or when the equilibrium theory was developed, People weren't looking at markets to test it regularly to see if it makes sense. They came up with that model and then they said, so this is how we can expect markets to behave. And the same with Homo economicus. They came up with the model of the person and then inferred things about how he would behave, or he or she would behave on that basis without trialling it afterwards. So it seems altogether less rigorous than science. Well, I, I don't know. How do you think they first got the idea, people? Uh, and it, it obviously, the equilibrium idea in, in particular markets far uh, antedates, so, so to speak, scientific economics. I mean, how do you get, how do you think you get the idea, this, this, this sort of notion here? Um, I mean, it obviously, you know, there were lots of markets at all times in history. There have been markets. And you find that probably that things get sold, you know, you don't, at the end of the day, you don't have lots of unsold apples around, lying around, that's, you know, that you get rid of them by lowering their price. I mean, that must have been an observation which everyone, every, every merchant, uh, every trader must have, uh, um, must have known that that's the way to behave. Um, you get what price you can, and then, you know, the, the market, the market um, equalizes the supplies and demand, and the prices move. I mean, that must uh, uh, have been known ever since people um, started trading with each other, uh, wasn't it? So you get that idea of equilibrium out of that. But then the interesting question, that's descriptive, and that may be descriptively quite accurate, uh, not about how the market system as a whole behaves, which is, a, which is of course, a, an intellectual construct, general equilibrium, but how a local market works and how. Um, but then, um, uh, what's the explanation for that? Uh, why shouldn't things be left unsold at the end of the day? Um, uh, why don't they just... Um, take them away and try to sell them the next day. Um, 
Uh, well, the answer is that they rot. So you have to sell them that day. But what's wrong with them rotting? Um, because you want to make a profit on it. Is that it? You want to, you want to, so you have to relate it. In other words, this behavior can't be um, uh, just, you have to have a principle just like Newton um, had to have something to explain why apples uh, fell to the ground and didn't just go off at a tangent and uh, perch on the nearest tree because they felt like it. So he had to introduce some principle like gravity that sort of forces them down, right? Um, so economists, when they started thinking about this peculiar behavior of the um, um, surplus apples always being disposed of by the end of the day, had to um, uh, appeal to some principle of human nature that enabled this to happen. And it seems so obvious to us. I just um, kind of wanted to apply it more to, to our everyday life and yeah. how, how yeah. it actually is relevant to, to the way we live our economies now. I kind of wanted to see how, how the current world of financialization and the current globalized economy, how, how can we still use this very simplified model of, of equilibrium um, where we no longer have this simple two-way kind of economy and at what cost it is to the population. Okay, well, well, right. Well, what about one important potential modification, which is the information requirement? I mean, how would that apply to financial market? First of all, as, a, as an individual, I may not have all the information that Google has about stock markets, for example. Yeah. And that's straight away where it, there is an inequality in terms of potential benefit. Yeah. OK, but you, on the other hand, you trust someone to have that information, maybe. But that again involves transaction fees and uh, the information. So that's a bit of a friction. You have to pay a transaction fee to someone to pro provide you with the information to equalize your. But that um, still doesn't guarantee me that perfect information, because there's different people who can provide the information, perhaps. <coughs> and depending on how much money I pay, I might get different but services. But of course, someone has that. I mean, you're, you're assuming, again, are you here? I mean, extrapolating from the simple housewife who has perfect information um, in, in, in the local market, you're assuming that someone has a perfect uh, information about how financial markets work as a whole. And therefore, you, you buy that. And therefore, your behavior is consistent with um, that perfect model. I mean, th those, that's the very, very strong assumption that um, efficient market hypothesis likes to use, isn't it? We say, ah, empirically, we, we, we obviously had a bit of a shock in 2008, 2009. <laughs> um, uh, right, but why did we have that shock? What, what, what did they get wrong? Um, that's, I think, the, the interesting uh, point, isn't it? Because we can't improve our, our, our ability to, to, to cope with the next shock um, unless we have some um, understanding of why the last shock occurred. And as far as I know, this kind of model with these kind of assumptions uh, that are needed to make it work don't give us that. Um, Am I, am I, am yeah, I, I saying something you, you, you disagree with that? No, I just want to add a little bit more to that. Um, so again, it doesn't give us any answers because, because of the assumptions it's based on. And one of them is that we are all rational beings and we all know that we are not. I mean, if you ask anybody what they would do if they win a lottery, they would do the most silly thing possible, not the most rational thing possible. So kind of that just shows us that the psychology of humans is not rational. Shackle who's uh, one of the great um, uh, disequilibrium theorists, um, together with um, the others I, I mentioned. He, he says that in some periods, expectations are such that you do get into equilibrium situations. He talked about ages of uncertainty as against ages of Certainty, ages of certainty, ages of uncertainty. You, and, and what causes things to be more certain um, and less certain is not entirely clear. Um, but nevertheless, the fact is clear. We're, 
you know, we're more certain in some periods that things are going to go right than at others. Do you think equilibrium is important? Probably the notion of equilibrium was born because of the mathematics being used in the, let's say, at the beginning of the uh, economics discipline as uh, being recognized as a science. So, uh, but then economics itself uh, developed and uh, it uh, began to utilize even more complex models, but still, uh, given also what you said, that is to say, we, as economists, we tend to express laws or behaviors as equations, where equations means also that we need identities or equalities, and that is also the mathematical translation of equilibrium. And um, it's also interesting to, to acknowledge the fact that one of the critiques about uh, the notion of equilibrium itself came from uh, the, the mainstream itself, or what we call the standard theory, which is, by the way, in my opinion, not a monolithic way of thinking because it, it has its own diversities. And uh, if we think about uh, results that we were developed in the 70s, in microeconomics especially, I'm thinking about a famous example is the so-called sunshine mantel de Brewer theory, by which it was more linked to micro foundations, but it adds also this notion, one of the assumptions was that we need to prove the existence of the equilibrium, not only the existence, but also uh, the fact that we can attain an equilibrium. Well, actually, that theorem showed, or presumed to show that we need specific assumptions also to derive uh, economic results at the macro level. And then this links back to the, also to the diagram, uh, the very simple supply and demand interaction diagrams uh, that we can build only if we have some assumptions and only if we are looking at specific markets or specific commodities. For instance, we were talking about uh, finance and financialization. If you look at uh, stock prices or, or the behavior of uh, agents engaging in financial transactions, uh, demand for share, shares is actually increasing when the prices increase. So we can no longer find out an equilibrium. So probably, I think it would be also useful to ask ourselves, why is this notion of equilibrium so persistent yeah. in the way in which we well, do economics? Because I think, do that think that... Why do you think it's so persistent? Well, Partly because it's useful to have, again, economic modeling, but then it's being readapted in different contexts because we have different notions like stochastic equilibriums, uh, random equilibriums, and uh, uh, even unemployment equilibriums. And I guess but you see, does it mean anything? Once you, once you um, start having so many of them, um, and um, uh, are, you, are you just sort of clinging to an empty shell into which you're pouring more and more things because you can't actually say, well, let's get rid of this shell completely um, and, and go, go start, start doing something else with the materials, start trying to organize it in a different way. Yes, that, that's also my uh, feeling about But we it. haven't got there. We haven't got there. I mean, the, the, um, the, I, think, I think Schumpeter is a very, very, uh, good case of someone who knows that equilibrium isn't the right framework but clings to it all the same because it's the only thing he's got. Um, if, if, if you abandon it, you just have chaos. I mean, I think also it has an appealing sense of cause and effect to the average person who is just trying to understand economics. And so, you know, something happens then you get an equal and opposite reaction. And I think it's just, it's very appealing to the basic way that we're taught about the way our world works um, scientifically and in society. And so I think that's a big reason why it's so persistent is like it may not always be the best label to put on something, but it's the one that makes the most sense to people and appeals the most. And I think yeah. that's a big part of it. Well, I think that's right, and, I, and I'm sure, I'm sure um, there's, there's, um, it's a very commonsensical idea. Uh, 
it's an observation, you know, that people are, you know, aware about, and it applies in all in all areas of life. You know, reaction produces a counteraction. Intervention sets the pendulum swinging. In natural sciences, you you have a reliable hypothesis to explain this, which seems to be, um, uh, I mean, it's a force of some kind, which seems to be there. You can't see it. In fact, in fact, some of the earlier earlier um, people who were speculating about what this force was, they they did sort of try and locate it and see if it had a tangible existence somewhere in the universe. And, and then eventually um, it became a hypothesis because they couldn't find it, and therefore it, it was the hypothesis to explain things. But. I was just interested in what the similar hypothesis is for human beings. We, as you rightly say, we notice that there are regularities. We also notice that we can very often uh, find quite reliable laws of cause and effect out of them. But we don't quite know why they're there, or why they exist. So we have a hypothesis to explain it. And the hypothesis is the basic hypothesis is, I think, boils down to two things which aren't that difficult to accept. One is some um, self-interest, some, 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 some desire for something, for, and the other is some calculating ability. I think those are the two things. They don't have to be anything much more than that to explain you know, quite a lot of um, events which we take for granted. An economic system is going to be a very complex beast, and this is so simple. I mean, the simplicity makes it super compelling, but, I mean, how do you effectively communicate all of the different individuals involved on each side and their self-interest and how that affects supply and demand and whether or not there's going to be a point of meeting that is in equilibrium? Uh, in this system. I mean, it just it takes into account essentially the point of sale, you know, who's buying and who's selling. And that doesn't, I mean, especially our supply chains uh, stretch around the world and products are sent all over to meet demands all over. And there's so many elements that go into what is demanded where and what is supplied where. And but the market coordinates it all. Uh, does it? Absolutely. I mean, yeah. Well, that's what it's meant to. It's uh, meant to per se, but I mean, you don't necessarily have all of. Again, this comes back to also information. I mean, you don't always know, as a market participant, how to really regulate everything uh, appropriately, because you don't always know what's out there. Yes, well, that's an information problem. You see, they, you always get, you can always get back to the the assumption. But do you really, do you really need to know that much as an economist? Let's say, a lot of sociological uh, people, more sociologically minded, say, well, I mean, you know, all all all, all preferences are socially constructed. So you um, actually want this because because you've been brought up to want this, or because of advertising, or whatever it might be. But then the, an economist might say, well, that may be so, but that's of no interest to me. All I want to explain is the price at which something you know, um, uh, fetches in the market. I don't need to know the sources of preferences or, or whether they're manipulated or not, or whether, you know, uh, provided the exchange is voluntary and provided there's sufficient competition, um, I don't, uh, that's all I need to know to explain what I need to explain. If you want to say, well, look, um, uh, these, these, pre these preferences um, are undesirable, that people should have those preferences, um, then you'd say, well, that, 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 well that, that, that's something an eth ethicist ought to consider or a moralist. It's not, not an economic problem. And uh, that's, that's, that tends to be um, a straightforward, typical, um, reaction. Um, and um, I don't agree with it, but I do think, I do think that's a, a get out. And as for the housewife, 
uh, you know, who's always very alert in her supermarket. You don't need to know whether she comes from Romania or, or Scotland or um, has a deprived childhood or uh, any other things that may, might have gone into, into um, um, uh, her preference set or her utility function. All you need to see is what, how it's exercised at the moment of sale, as you said the point of sale. And economics beyond that has no responsibility, no explanatory responsibility. But of course, I don't think that's right. And even economists don't entirely accept it. They accept the idea, um, or do, 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 does this model allow the idea of harm, self-harm, to come into, into the picture? In other words, is it right to intervene in the market to prevent people harming themselves? Um, that is really accepted, isn't it? Because I don't think even a, neo, a neoclassical economist might well say that some people are not able to choose rationally uh, um, because of some defect of some kind. Either they're not old enough, I mean, say so there's an exception for children, or but doesn't the market just correct that? What? Isn't that just a market correction? So they just get disciplined by the market. Uh, right? Well, That's the same, it's the same argument as with the stock market, so isn't it? Yeah, but it is a market. It is, it is, it is, um, a, it is an argument for which uh, someone like Friedman has used for legalizing drugs. So you do self-harm, but you learn. Yeah, you learn. You might not learn, but so this this then then um, uh, brings into the ex extraordinary um, uh, centre. It brings into the centre of attention the idea of 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 the short run and the long run. Um, in the long run, you learn. In the short run, you die. Um, <laughs> but of course, the. The, the, the population learns in the long run. And, and, there, and a Hayek is a very, very important, it's a very important element in Hayekian uh, economics, this learning process, which is the market uh, uh, enables you to learn. So you, you have a great slump. Um, and this, this was actually the argument he was using, in, by the way, in the early 1930s. You have a great slump, you don't try and you don't try and rescue people from the slum. They've got to learn that if they borrow too much money, um, they're going to go bust. And the banks have to learn that um, if they lend too much money, they're going to go bust. So you, 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 you have a situation in which the slump is produced by excessive credit and debt in the economy. And... Um, uh, that, that means that the economy crashes. But you don't try and overcome that by pumping more credit and debt into the economy to enable it to keep going, because that simply produces a bigger crash the next time round. You let the whole economy collapse. So what's wrong with that? I mean, well, it won't be long. I mean, learning is quite fast. You need to start up again quite soon. I mean, as Cain said, in the long run, we'll all be dead. So, you know, right. the next generation might learn, but we'll still be worse off ourselves. And so, yes, no one likes that. I think, I think this is absolutely a key point. How short is the short run? I think it's an... It's, it's, it's another one of these. You get a textbook and you can never find out. They always say the short run, the long run, the short run. You never know how long the short run is, or how short the long run is. These, these terms, I think, have lost all real meaning. I mean, the short run should be simply the time it takes to correct the deviation. But that doesn't tell you how long it is in chronological time. Um, so what do you do then if you have no, uh, if you have no um, idea of what the short run um, is? Um, do you say, OK, well, we're only interested in the long run. The short run is of no interest to us. It's a deviation. Could, 
economic theory should not be concerned with deviations from principles, but with elucidating the principles themselves. And then whether you allow a deviation to persist or whether you try, that may be a, a problem of policy, but it's not to do with economics. It may be that you can't afford as a government to allow um, a, your, your citizens to take to the streets. That's a political issue. It's nothing to do with economics. Well, if they're in the streets, they're not producing economically. Um, no, but that's a deviation, and you'll soon get a new government, and they'll start doing it. <laughs> but, but the interesting thing is, when, when Hayek um, was asked to give advice to <clears throat> Margaret Thatcher in, in, in the early 1980s, um, he, I, I remember this very, very clearly. He wrote an article in the, in the um, uh, uh, Times, and that article said, I don't agree with this policy of gradual disinflation. You know, they had a disinflationary policy that was going to last for five years, at the end of which the rate of growth of the money supply would, would not be inflationary any longer. He said, I don't agree with it. What you need, it's not credible. What you need is an immediate cessation of money creation, immediately, now, from tomorrow. There will be unemployment of 60% for about a year, but after that, you'll be fine. I mean, a lot can happen in a year. A lot of very bad things. It's, it's very interesting that Hayek was advancing this kind of argument um, just as Hitler was coming to power in Germany on the back of, um, you know, on the back of uh, a quarter of the population being out of work. But should an economist mind about that? He'd say, well, look, that's a political issue. I mean, what you do about it, I'm telling you what, I'm t giving you laws of cause and effect, and I'm explaining why things might be such and such, but what you do about it, that's not, that's not my concern. Yeah, one thing I would say is that it, that kind of example shows that they're not ultimately giving explanations of laws, because if this, if this were a law, then there wouldn't have to be these corrections. As you explained, they're frictions, and so it proves that they're not laws as such, they're tendencies. And what I was going to say is that actually I think the equilibrium concept is useful, but useful not in terms of explaining how things actually are, because clearly it's not how things are, but explaining how things would be if all the economic assumptions were to hold. So it's not so much a question of these things hold, everyone's self-interested, everyone's perfectly rational, perfectly informed, and therefore we have equilibrium, but more to the extent that people are well in, uh, perfectly informed and to the extent that they're rational and so forth, then we'll move towards an equilibrium. So I think it is still a useful concept for explaining general tendencies in the market and uh, why the price sometimes goes up, why it sometimes goes down when there's over or under supply. And, I, and to that extent, I think it is useful and it's worth keeping. Um, but I think that the correct uh, status of equilibrium theory is not as an explanation of how things are, but how things will be to the extent that the assumptions that lead to equilibrium hold in society.